Good. Morning, church. How are we doing? Good, good. It's, it's always interesting, well, not interesting, it's somewhat surprising when you arrive at church and someone goes, you're wearing pants, you're wearing a button-up shirt, you must be preaching. <laughs> I think I may have some kind of reputation always hanging around in shorts and thongs, but uh, anyway, <laughs> for those of you that don't know me, my name's Quinton. Um, I'm part of the team at Grace City Church, uh, currently serving here in Diwa, but also have the amazing privilege at the moment to be working with an incredible team to actually plant our third site on the Upper North Shore. Uh, we're currently meeting in St. Ives, and fair to say that God is doing amazing things. We, we're in the process of actually running Alpha. We, we're on our fifth Sunday now. And God really is doing amazing stuff. We, we're incredibly encouraged by what he's doing. So I would just ask as we continue to forge ahead that you as a church continue to just back us in prayer. Um, really, really um, well received and we, 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 we love to receive your prayer. Um, and then also just obviously for Alpha going forward, but then also as a site as we continue to meet and, and determine and just hear from God in terms of what are our next uh, steps. Um, so, yeah, we'd really appreciate that. So this morning, I'm incredibly honored to be closing out Acts, not because it actually originally started a few years ago, um, but because it's probably my most favorite book in the Bible. And if you're joining us for the first time today, you in for a bit of a treat. You're going to get a very quick run through of the story of Acts, how we've got to this point. Um, And then from there, we're going to delve into Acts 28, basically where Paul arrives in Rome, and we're going to look for some application as to how we take this forward um, in our lives. So, before we start, can I just pray? Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, I just thank you that you continue to call us into more. Father, I pray that um, I just thank you, Lord, that you call us into a deeper relationship with you. Father, I just pray and give thanks that you call us into more for your kingdom. Holy Spirit, just come and be with us now, I pray. Just come and minister to us, prompt us, and lead us, Holy Spirit. So it's grand finals weekend. There's Rugby World Cup on. And I'm sure a lot of you, like me, you can't watch every game, although I have to get the highlights package for the Ireland versus Japan, like there was something absurd happened there. But sometimes the highlights package is just a little bit important. It just allows you just to get a sense of what sort of took place. So for the purpose of today, I'm going to give you probably the quickest run through ever in terms of acts. So here we go. We're going to try and get through the story of acts in about three minutes. I I probably should have a drink of water, but here we go. (laughs) Okay, so after his crucifixion, Jesus comes back to life and hangs around with the apostles for 40 days, proving he is alive. He tells them that they will receive the Holy Spirit and gives us the great commission in Acts 1 verse 8, saying, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Sumeria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus then returns to heaven. The disciples were gathered together at Pentecost when, as promised, the Holy Spirit arrives and fills them. Tongues of fire are rested on each of them, and they spoke in tongues. Peter pre- preaches to a crowd of 3,000. Uh, sorry, uh, Peter preaches to a crowd, and 3,000 were saved, and the gospel advance begins. Peter heals a crippled beggar. He preaches again, and another 2,000 are saved. Peter and John get thrown in jail, and they're then released. They celebrate with the other believers and pray for continued boldness. God then rocks the house and fills them with the Holy Spirit. Peter and John are thrown in jail again, nearly put to death, but instead they are flogged and sent on their way, ordered never to speak of Jesus again. Yeah, right. So the apostles then nominate seven deacons to look after the widows and the orphans, including Stephen. Stephen is then seized and stoned to death. Watching the stoning is this guy called Saul. Persecution breaks out, believers scatter, and things start to look bad for the church. Or do they? Wherever these believers were scattered, they start to spread the word, and we start to see the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Philip meets the Ethiopian eunuch and baptizes him. 
Meanwhile, Saul is on his way to Damascus to continue his persecution of the believers. Then Jesus appears. Paul is blinded. Paul is healed. Paul repents and starts preaching the gospel to the people he was actually going to persecute. Peter has a vision of unclean animals. Peter has an, enc has an encounter with unclean Gentiles. The penny drops, and Peter understands that God has extended salvation to the Gentiles. Herod is struck down for not praising God and is eaten by worms. Barnabas and Saul set off to spread the word. Saul is now called Paul. In Lystra, Paul and Barnabas get stoned for not letting people worship them. Paul and Barnabas part ways. Paul teams up with Silas and Timothy. Paul has a vision of a man from Macedonia asking for help, and he rushes off at once. Paul and Silas then end up in jail again. They pray, they sing, an earthquake breaks, breaks down the walls. The prison guard is led to Jesus. The traveling and the preaching continues. Paul heads back to Jerusalem. Paul is arrested. The Lord visits Paul and tells him he will testify about him in Rome. Paul is transferred to Caesarea, where he waits for his case to be heard for two years. Paul appears to Caesar and gets on a fast ship and is put on a fast ship to Rome. There is a storm, the ship sinks, Paul is bitten by a snake. And the part of the story that we're looking at this morning is Paul finally makes it to Rome, where he's put under house arrest. He continues to preach the gospel and he awaits trial and at the same time writes a number of New Testament books. Everyone there? <laughs> That's exhausting. And I wasn't even doing the traveling. <laughs> but that, friends, is an, a very quick whistle-stop tour of Acts. Effectively, the start of the early church and how the gospel was spread around the known world. Paul's many journeys and God's incredible favor on him during that time. So as we get our minds into, this, uh, in, into the mindset of the last chapter and we consider Paul's journey to this point, a bit of confession time. Who here is a Netflix junkie? Come on. Okay. So if you are, we're going to have a little bit of fun here quickly. So if you are, you've probably watched a documentary or maybe you've watched a documentary on this guy called Richard Froney. Okay. The documentary is called The Fittest Man in History. Now, me watching this was purely out of personal interest and pursuit to see how far I had to go. But this documentary gives us an incredible account of Richard, who is a CrossFit athlete, um, and the story of his life, his routine, and his attempt to win his fourth consecutive CrossFit Games title. Okay, so here's the spoiler alert. Boy meets girl. Boy and girl fall in love. Boy trains a huge amount, and he wins the title. And he's declared the fittest man in history. And I know that Richard wouldn't, wouldn't mind me saying this because he's a Christian himself, um, complete with a Galatians 6 uh, verse 14 tattoo down his torso. I think we've got a picture of it. <laughs> okay, but I would challenge this and his title based on Paul's incredible journeys in Acts. You see, Paul's three missions between Asia Minor and Greece, and then finally on to Rome, saw him traveling about 25,000 kilometers. About 14,000 of those were by, by land, and 11,000 by sea. Granted, this was over a bit of an extended period, okay? But for the purpose of today, and sorry, Richard, but we're going to give the fittest man in history title to Paul, complete with a ripping six-pack, um, and his own tattoo. Now, we can all debate what Paul's tattoo might say, but anyway, like I said, a little bit of fun. But back to this morning's message. We now find ourselves in the home straight of chapter 28 as Paul leaves Malta after surviving the storm that shipwrecked them and the venomous snake bite. And we pick up the story from Acts 28 from verse 11 to 31. I'm going to break it down into two parts, and it will be on the screen behind me, so you can follow as I start to unpack each verse. But following the shipwreck, we know that Paul was in the island for three months. We read in earlier parts of Acts 28 that Paul used this time to transform, to transform an entire community. 
which, if it hasn't, hadn't been for the shipwreck, may have actually been missed altogether. So regardless of Paul's perceived setback, Paul was using every single opportunity he had to share the gospel and to pray for people and to heal the sick, right from the chief official on the island, the most powerful man's father, to verse 9, where he refers to the rest of the island. You see, it wasn't a, a healing or a transformation. It was a healing and a transformation for all, not just a select few or for those of importance. And we need to believe that sometimes God can use us better by means of a shipwreck than if he had actually delivered us safely to our desired destination. Our perceived shipwreck can potentially have a more meaningful impact on others than on ourselves, something that Paul knew far too well. Miles spoke last week on the importance of relying on God during our shipwreck. And the transformation of Malta is a testimony to Paul understanding that fact and the work done whilst Paul wasn't at his desired destination. The rest of their voyage on the way to Rome is relatively uneventful for a change. And after stopping off in two ports, they finally reach Putu, Putu Liu. <laughs> um, does that right? And we read in verse 14 that in Putuliu that they meet brothers and sisters there. You see, they had heard that Paul was coming. And they too traveled to go and see him. So this confirms for us that there was already church, there was already in a church that existed there, perhaps planted by Roman Christians or even Jewish converts. Paul spent seven days with them. We can imagine what that time was like. It would have been an amazing time of teaching. Paul would have been sharing with them, building them up. It would have been a time of prayer uh, for the journey ahead and, and setting them apart. But verse 15 also speaks about Paul himself being encouraged and thankful to God. So as these brothers and sisters who had traveled to see Paul and meet up with him and receive from him, their impact on Paul was just as important. It was just as impactful. And I think it's such a great reminder for, for us that even when we don't think our own actions or presence is important, that it can have such an impact on those around us. And finally, with no real great build-up at all, we land at verse 16. The fulfillment of God's instruction to Paul in Acts 23, where the Lord instructs him that he will testify in Rome as well. And Paul's own prompting prior to that in Acts 19, where he said, I must visit Rome also. You see, at this point, Paul has come through a number of hardships. His time in and out of prison, the shipwreck, the snake bite. But it is clear that God's favor and miraculous hand was on him, ensuring the fulfillment of God's promise and his purpose for Paul, but also importantly for the gospel. We then move on to verse, the second part, verse 17 to 31. After three days, relatively short space of time, Paul, he isn't taking any time to pause, any time to reflect. Although his last journey has carried him some two and a half thousand kilometers, he's getting on with the reason that he was in Rome. He's taken the initiative. We can imagine that Paul's arrival in Rome would have caused some concern for the Jewish leaders. So, so what does Paul do? He, he gets on the front foot with them. He's taken the lead by looking to, and, and looking to avoid any opposition or antagonism that may have actually followed him, followed him. So he goes ahead and he gathers the leaders of the Jews. And the first thing he does is he identifies with them as brothers. So what Paul's looking to do here, he's looking to gain a little bit of street cred, isn't he? He's, he's giving an account that he's one of them. He identifies with their customs, he identifies with their ancestors, 
And he's given them a bit of comfort that he's legitimate. He's one of them. I'm a Jew from Tarsus. He's connecting with them on a personal level. He then goes on to give an account of why he is there. Now, of course, we have an understanding because it was detailed only a few chapters before for us. But reading from, chapter, from verse 17, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. See, this is the sixth time that Paul is having to make a defense of who he was, what he stood for, and what he believed. Six times that God had gone before him, that God had interceded for Paul with an outcome that brought him closer to where God actually wanted him to be. The purpose and the power of God's ongoing faithfulness here to Paul is so incredible. And something that we need to believe is possible and true for us still today. Paul's comment in verse 19 about not intending to bring, to bring any charge against his own people is remarkable. But it doesn't surprise me because it's so in line with Paul's journey to this stage. You see, Paul would have had every right to be there bringing a claim a counterclaim against the opponents that, had, that were guilty of malicious prosecution against Paul. And this would have had serious consequences for the Jews in Rome at this time. But Paul doesn't make it about himself. He's accepting of the opposition, but he makes it about something far bigger, far greater than anything he was worthy of. And he goes on to explain in verse 20 that it was because of the hope of Israel that he was bound in chains. Not because of the malicious prosecution, not for any other reason, not because of any other person, leader, opposition, but other than the hope of Israel. Can you picture the scene where he's standing there lifting up his chains and declaring it is the, for the hope of Israel that I am bound in these chains as he waves his arms around. Now, this claim and reference to Israel would have certainly have resonated with the, the Jewish leaders. And they would have absolutely been paying attention to where Paul was going with this analogy. But what we know is that Paul is continuing to reinforce what he had declared so many times before during Acts. That as a result of the resurrection hope of Israel has been fulfilled in the purpose and the work of the Messiah Jesus. Probably to Paul's surprise, the Jewish leaders confirm that they haven't received any letters from Judea concerning Paul and that no one had spoken badly or criticized him. So two scenarios, I guess, here. Either the letters hadn't arrived or the Sanhedrin themselves had decided to drop the case against Paul. Whichever it was, and scholars and people far cleverer than me can debate it, but I'm going to simply put it down to the fact that Paul was not complete with the work that God wanted him to do. God's miraculous favor was on Paul again. Once again, God had gone before Paul and forged a path where he probably thought that the end was upon him. So the brilliant twist here is that, as we read in verse 23, that Paul was under house arrest, and he was chained to the guards, and he wasn't allowed to leave. But the twist in the story is that his captors now become his own captive audience. So can you imagine being a prison guard in that situation on your sort of six-hour rotation shift, and all you hear all day long is Paul preaching on and on about Jesus. <laughs> so it goes on to say that large numbers turned up to hear him speak and to hear his views. 
And Paul witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And he tried to convince them about Jesus. As mentioned earlier, and I want to come back to this, that once again we need to understand that this was the fulfillment of God's declaration to Paul in Acts 23 verse 11, where Paul had instructed where the Lord had instructed Paul to testify in Rome. Can you imagine the authority at which Paul preached and shared, knowing that this was the fulfillment of God's declaration over him? Let's think about that in our own lives. How many times have we had a prophetic word spoken over our lives? Or a declaration of God spoken over our lives that we give up on? Or don't potentially follow through with. God wants to bring these to fulfillment. Let's not lose hope. Don't stop trusting for his favor. Like Paul, it may just mean that you need to take a 25,000 kilometer round trip. Or that you need six trials, storms, a snake bite. But God still wants to bring these to fruition. And God's declaration over you won't change. Paul shared from morning till evening, all day. What an absolute privilege that must have been. Now we know that there's no record of anybody falling asleep or falling out of a window like in Acts 20. So we can imagine that people were hanging on every single word Paul was saying at this time. The reference to him trying to convince them about Jesus is really important for us to consider. And I felt it's something that God actually challenged me in because I think far too often as Christians, we can shrink back and say, I want people to see how I carry out my life and identify that there's something different in me. Or um, I will plant a seed and and let God do the rest. I want to be a light in the darkness. I want people to see Jesus through me. And I'm sure we've all said that. And I know I have. And whilst there's nothing wrong at all with these behaviors and these characteristics, they're good things. This verse is talking about something a little bit more direct, an upfront approach, convincing. Other versions of this this verse refer to persuading them. Now let's understand that that's not arguing somebody to Christianity. It's far softer than that. It's, It's a persuasion... It's an encouragement. We know that that encouragement itself is a gift of the Holy Spirit that Paul talks about in Romans and one we can all ask God for. Can you imagine the power of every single one of us operating out of a gift of encouragement and using that to persuade people and seek out Jesus in our own daily lives? This leads us perfectly into verse 24 where the verse goes on to tell us that some were convinced by what was said and others would not believe. Jesus himself spoke about this in the parable of the sower, where he refers to the seed or the gospel and people's own response to it with only 25% falling on good ground, where people who hear, understand, and receive the gospel, and the rest fall in on hard ground or stony, thorny ground. And this is what happened to Paul. So we can take comfort that Paul, the incredible apostle, was not able to convince everybody, but he was doing his bit. He was on the front line. He was persuading people daily in any scenario, whether that be in Malta or in chains. And then Paul's final statement, where he refers back to the scriptures, once again making the connection to their ancestors. And this is the part that starts to get the crowd all worked up, um, and they start disagreeing amongst themselves, and they begin to leave. You see, the disagreement was amongst themselves. The disagreement wasn't with Paul. So we can imagine that as a result of some hearing... 
and some understanding and others not, it's such a powerful image that those that heard and understood only moments before were now the ones that were potentially doing the convincing and the persuading. And the part that riled up the crowd is, in, is when Paul refers back to the scriptures and this time out of Isaiah 6, verse 9 to 10, which reads, The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through, the, through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will, you will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn. And I would heal them. And then the ultimate climax for us in Acts, summarizing the main theme of the entire book. Having presented the gospel to the Jews in Rome, and having, seen, and, and having witnessed their rejection of it, Paul now focuses his ministry to the Gentiles, and again to the Gentiles. Acts 28, verse 28, proclaims the mission's future and the fact that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and declares that they will listen. This statement was also in accordance with God's own promise and command in Acts 13, verse 46 to 47, which stated... I've made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. What Paul is not doing here is he's not saying based on their responses that we now turn to the Gentiles at the expense of the Jews, but rather that the response of people to the same mission, to the same gospel, will be different. It could be also suggested that he's looking to make the Jews jealous, to almost incentivize them to find in Jesus the hope of Israel. And for those following, we now get to verse 29, which you'll see behind me doesn't actually exist in many translations. So we refer to the King James Version, which um, goes on to say, and when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Now, there's many reasons to suggest why that verse doesn't exist in all Bibles, and we're not going to go there. But I like the fact that it provides some clarity for us on what would have undoubtedly have happened at that time. See, the Jews leaving the gathering, and the word is used there is reasoning. We're going back to discussing persuading, convincing, encouraging each other in what they had actually just heard. And then, abruptly, Acts ends in verse 30 and 31, where it goes on to say, Paul stayed for two years in a rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Luke's, Luke's inclusion of uh, the reference to a rented house here is actually quite interesting, but... I believe that it was to confirm that it wasn't a permanent thing for Paul. And yes, he was under house arrest, but renting suggests temporary. It suggests that I'm here for a short period of time and then I'm moving on. Something that Paul had done throughout Acts. So why would his behavior have changed now that he got to Rome, even though he was still under house arrest? Verse 30 also reiterates that once again, that he welcomed all. Not just the Jews, but the Gentiles and all who wanted to hear and see him. And the final verse of Acts 31, as we bring this chapter to a close, Paul boldly and without hindrance, with no official impediments, no restraints, despite the fact that he was on, uh, under house arrest, preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is where the book ends. But we can't say the end. Because although it ends, 
it's sort of left in a bit of, left mid-air, in a bit of suspense. And a part of us is asking, well, what about Paul? And a part of us is asking, well, what next? But Luke's abrupt end to the book ensures that we make this about the gospel and not the human characters in the story. You see, throughout Acts, we read about Peter, Paul, Stephen, Philip, Barnabas, to name a few. Each of these characters were just eyewitnesses and servants of the word, as Luke referenced when he wrote Luke 1 verse 2. So where does it leave us? And how do we conclude or apply the teachings as we've gone through Acts? I think that we can make some incorrect assumptions in our conclusion. And firstly, and although I, I sort of joked about this in the beginning, but Acts is not a story about superhumans. It's not about the fittest man in the world. Acts is not a story about Paul and his incredible life and ministry. Now, there's no doubt that the story confirms that. And in no way am I looking to overshadow what Paul did. But it's a story about ordinary people and their extraordinary God. God using ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Peter, the hero, in the first part of Acts, makes the following statements in Acts 10, verse 26. He says, I am only a man, one to be copied as an example, instead of worshipped as a saint. And Paul himself, in Acts 14, verse 15, asks the crowd in frustration, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. It was never about them or the role they played in the expansion of the gospel. They consistently deflected away from themselves and they were never seeking admiration for the job done. But rather, just consistently pointing to God. Everything they did was to put the spotlight on God. A great reminder for us. I'll just call the band up, please. The other mistake that we could potentially make is, as, as, as we finish the book of Acts, is to look at it with just pure, excited optimism. That we simply try and imitate the way that the early church grew. Their passion, their strategy, hoping that we could have the same result. But Luke warns us against this. And like Peter and Paul did in deflecting away from themselves, Luke makes over 250 references to the Lord, to Jesus, to Christ, and to the Holy Spirit in the first part of Acts alone. And that's to stir us to action and to challenge our own response. I love this quote from Phil Moore in his Straight to the Heart series book, which I found so useful in putting a lot of this uh, message together. But he writes, The book of Acts is not a spiritual pep talk which urges Christians to fulfill their hidden potential. It's a book which pulls no punches to inform us that without God, we have absolutely no potential at all. And another mistake that I think we can make is to assume that this is only a story from the past and it has no relevance for us today. I believe that the mid-air cliffhanger approach where we finish confirms that the story needs to go on. It's a call to action. The challenge of the Great Commission is as relevant for us today as it was for the early Christians. The urgency and the importance and the weight of reaching the lost needs to be something that we constantly strive for. But we shouldn't approach the task or the commission on us with a view that is too large, but rather the only one that could be achieved in the power of the Almighty God. Just as God converted Saul from a Christian oppressing man with hatred in his heart to the Apostle Paul, probably the most, inf the most influential character of the gospel in the early church. And like Paul, God is the one who chose us from the beginning. He entrusted us with the gospel. 
He's the one who fills us with the Holy Spirit. He gives us the authority and he wants to carry us to victory. Hudson Taylor once wrote that all God's giants have been men who did great things for God because they reckoned on God being with them. God used ordinary men in Acts to do extraordinary things. And I believe that we each have a chapter to write. That we each have our own chapter of Acts to write in an, what, a cliffhanger, unfinished book. Whether that be Acts 29, 30, 31, whatever it is. But it's only by God's power and the Holy Spirit that we can write our own individual conclusion to that story and our own individual conclusion to Acts. Like Peter and Paul, we are servants of the word. How we conclude the story is completely up to us. And we're going to go into a time of worship, but I would ask God just during this time just to reveal to you personally what is your individual Acts 23 go to Rome declaration. What is that declaration that God has spoken over your life that you need to that, that, that you just need to have spoken over your life again or God to reignite that fire inside you? And how will you write your own conclusion to Acts? What will that chapter say? And like Paul, yes, it will have a legacy, but where's it going to point? And who's it going to glorify? 